Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos in our group reading of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit by moving on today to the 13th lecture over the section of the text titled The Law of the Heart and the Frenzy of Self-Conceit. This is part of a challenge where every buddy within the school has basically been assigned the rest of the book to finish within the next two months. By early October, we will have reached uh, the final stage of absolute knowing, and we'll actually um, go through that introductory material after the whole book is done. That might sound a little bit backwards to you since that is, of course, at the very beginning, but I think that Hegel's theory about how dialectic works in the abstract might actually make better sense after we have all this concrete content to exemplify it. Um, of course, that is a controversial stance, but uh, the way things worked out in our group reading, um, starting with Sense Certainty all the way back in May of 2020, uh, this is just the way that things work out for us. And um, either way, it's, it'll, it's going to be a lot of fun. And it might sound like um, we have a long way to go. But really, if you just consider from sense certainty to absolute known, we've already covered about 40% of the book. So we're already pretty close to halfway done. And of course, it's been a great pleasure. And something which I think um, we really could not do anywhere else. I mentioned many times before, um, I'm not aware of any um, university really within the world, and certainly not within the United States, where you're actually going to read this entire book. You'd be lucky to read just the um, Slave Master Dialectic um, at this point. And of course, the only thing that uh, the professor will mention about that is, oh, and then Marx later used this for other uh, communist purposes. But um, here we're actually going to read the entire book, and I thank everybody who supported the channel and joined me. So just as the last section featured the memorable character of Faust, this section also features a character who is basically Rousseau, or the Enlightenment thinker, who is led by reason itself to hypothesize about the so-called noble savage. According to this theory, human nature is inherently good, and it is only later corrupted by civilization and societal influences which can be removed in order to restore that originally pure state of, above all, the human heart. Hegel explicitly cites um, Schiller's play The Robins, which is about a man who lives in the woods with a band of robins, um, within this section of the text, as yet another memorable literary meditation on the same theme of the so-called noble savage. On a deeper philosophical level, though, we find this sort of stuff appearing at this stage of the phenomenology, because whereas Faust tried to um, maximize his own selfish pleasures by sneaking around the universal law, um, even to the point of literally selling his soul to the devil in the single worst example of violating the laws of God last section, um, that phase, you might recall, ended with a reconciliation between private desire and universal law with Faust willingly surrendering to the universal law, in which case he found that it was no longer alien, but now it was basically his own law, and that became the starting point for this particular section. Paragraph 367 then opens with the subject openly celebrating that he is now so reconciled with a law that is no longer alien necessity, um, and is so reconciled with it as to be that necessity on a direct and immediate level. Hegel says, in this new form of self-consciousness, it knows its own self to be the principle of necessity. It knows that it has the universal law immediately within itself, and for this very reason, it is now to be properly called the law of heart. In addition, this stage explicitly reconciles pleasure with necessity because the higher satisfaction is understood to be realized through the law rather than in violation of it, as Faust mistakenly assumed last section. However, this is really just another way of saying that the law of the heart has an inherent teleological orientation towards realization or actualization in the real world, as paragraph 368 notes. It is not enough, in other words, for the law of the heart to remain merely a law of the heart, for this is a particular interpretation, we might be reminded, of the ideal of active reason. This is basically like the second um, sort of movement within a triad following after Faust's um, idea of active reason, and for that reason, it has to be acted out rather than left in a state of pure interior potentiality. By paragraph 369, reason finds, though, that the real world in which its own law has to be actualized is not actually lawless. Rather, the real world is already filled with another long-established universal law. And in a certain sense, it finds itself 
in a situation akin to the uh, cowboys uh, gunfighting in a you know dusty road in a, some western frontier town, finding that there really ain't enough room in this place for the two of us. In other words, reason reacts to its own discovery of a universal law already there within the world by simply falling back on positing a strict dualism between the true law, which is of course in its own heart, and the false law, which is already there in the world. While its own law is pure and absolute, the law of the world is evil and oppressive. It is an artificial system of mandates which can only be enforced through violence and coercion, and which lacks any deeper foundation than a groundless performative act. Closer examination reveals, though, that the laws have a lot more in common with one another than this individual is willing to admit. For example, the law of the heart is felt to be true precisely because it holds the guarantee of bringing a universal happiness to all people to whom it is spread, rather than just the lone individual who is fortunate enough to have discovered it. Yet this Evangelical need to universalize the law of heart for all people can only be realized on a practical level through a performative act of externalization which turns that law into an outer thing which is basically indistinguishable from the same universal law um, enforced through performative means that the individual found objectionable to begin with. The individual also finds that such a law ends up being just as arbitrary and self-grounding as the world's law which it tried to subvert. By paragraph 371, though, the individual um, finds more and more difficulty in rationally justifying his preference for one law over the other. This is especially the case when he is forced to openly admit that there is a good deal of overlap between these two, even at the level of their literal content. For example, many of the things prohibited in one law are also prohibited by name in the other. Many of the things mandated in one law are also mandated by name in the other. He dismisses all of this as, of course, a mere coincidence, insisting that insofar as these two might happen to say the same thing, this is only at the level of accidental surface level detail. The deeper essential core of the law is not any such particular content, but only its origin in the heart or its lack thereof. Considered that way, it's obvious which of these laws is the true one, in other words, the one which is originating in the heart, and which of these is the false one, which lacks just such an origin. This is, though, just another way of saying that the law of my heart is true for no reason except that it's mine, which is itself just another way of saying that reason has once again missed the mark of universality and has dropped down to the status of a private opinion that is merely meant in the precise sense of being merely mine. You recall the German play on words meinen as the word both for uh, something intended in the sense of being... Um, uh, private opinion rather than a universal truth and something that is mine in the sense of, well, in this case, being literally within my heart, you'll find, though, that this um, recurring theme within the phenolo phenomenology that we've seen all the way back at, say, section one, has resurfaced at this particular point in the phenomenology, ironically enough, through the most fanatical act of attempting to universalize the law of um, my own heart for the welfare of all mankind in paragraph 370, which somehow only made it less universal as a result of this same brute act of attempting universalization. By paragraph 372, we find more ironic still is the way that this actualization of the uh, individual's law of heart into the publicly accessible sphere of reality had not only failed to gain universal reconciliation with every single individual within that huge populated mass of others, but it had even failed the test of identification by the individual who had carried out the act in the first place. In other words, whereas such an act of enforcing the law of the heart was done precisely because it promised to meet the ideal conditions of allowing one to achieve pleasure in a direct conformity with the law, rather than seek pleasure in 
the transgression against the law as Faust had tried last section. The individual who actually does this is only shocked to find himself confronted by a new law out there which is every bit as alien as the one which he had rebelled against in the first place. Somehow, the law of my heart ceases to be the law of my heart precisely after I follow it to the logical conclusion of acting out on it instead of merely contemplating it in the abstract. This actualized law takes on a life of its own, though, and just keeps on growing and growing in a frightening display of embodying the same notional content of universality which it can somehow only carry out through negating me and acting autonomously in direct contradiction with whatever uh, uh, minor intentions might be housed within my heart. Rather than act freely under the ideal conditions of a, a willfully engineered noble savage um, environment, I only find myself entangled in a jumbled mess of ordinances which are experienced as hopelessly arbitrary and terribly repressive. In paragraph 373, the individual finds that the actualization of the law of his own heart into a concrete deed in the real world has failed once again to satisfy the conditions of that mysterious, um, highly coveted universal object. We will recall that this was the holy grail which motivated um, every section of observing reason and active reason each of which failed to actually find it. Well, that failure has resurfaced in the precise sense that the law of the individual heart, which claims to hold the secret to bring universal happiness to everyone else so long as they just agree to do whatever this particular person tells them to do, is not a universal object at all. It's just the heart of one particular guy. Hegel notes himself that the others do not find in this content the fulfillment of the law of their own hearts, but rather that of somebody else. Ironically enough, it is precisely the mandate to follow your heart which leads all of these other people to rebel against the arbitrary regulations which one particular asshole is trying to shove down their throats on the basis of an authority which they do not at all recognize as legitimate, let alone universal. In paragraph 374, the individual reacts to his own failure to win over the hearts of everyone else by positing a new dualism in which only his own heart is recognized to have the purity of the untainted noble savage. Everyone else's heart is complicit in animating the world's oppressive law with their power, which of course is so badly corrupted by the same societal and civilizational influences which they prop up in a uh, never-ending positive feedback loop that only makes the situation worse and worse as time goes on, that um, the only law of heart which is actually deserving of that title is, of course, mine. By paragraph 375, this individual becomes a living contradiction who is fundamentally incapable of reconciling the antithesis between its own interior law of the heart and the work which it can actually perform in the realization of that law into the form of a concrete object in the real world. Quite predictably, by paragraph 376, this cognitive dissonance leads to full-blown insanity, followed by, in paragraph 377, so many elaborate conspiracy theories laying the blame on fanatical priests and gluttonous despots who surely ruin the otherwise perfect law of my heart by inhibiting its actualization in the world, largely through imposing their own arbitrary laws and hogging all of the figurative real estate space among other people's hearts, leaving virtually no room for me and my law to colonize their minds. This individual, of course, fails to notice the grand irony that these two opposing forces are actually structurally identical to one another. For the one who attempts to force every single person, without exception, to accept an arbitrary law for no reason except that it is mine, is indeed somebody who deserves to be labeled a fanatical priest and gluttonous despot, but it is precisely the one carrying out the law of the heart who merits these titles the most.
By paragraph 378, we finally realize that the universal law which this person opposed is not a dead necessity detached from the heart, but is itself the law of all hearts, rather than the law of one single idealist revolutionary who was mistaken to think that the law of the heart which he found himself was the only one in existence. Hegel noted that the others resisted that individual's intrusions into the ethical substance precisely because it was an attack upon them. He said the established laws are defended against the law of the individual because they are not an unconscious, empty, and dead necessity, but a spiritual universality and substance in which those in whom the spiritual substance has its actuality live as individuals and are conscious of themselves. Hegel goes on to say that they cling to it with their hearts because if this ordinance were taken away from them, or if they placed themselves outside of it, they would lose everything. We have unwittingly returned then to the ethical substance which began this broader set of sections after observing reason, and we have um, found ourselves there again by realizing that society is not at all an artificial deviation away from the law of the supposed noble savage's unspoiled heart, rather a society is to be defined just as the actualization of so many hearts. Society is tainted precisely because all of the hearts are always already tainted in the first place. By paragraph 379, we realize that society is always already unstable and filled with internal contradictions and disagreements because each individual follows his or her own heart with disregard for what others' hearts might have to say. If one refuses to compromise with other hearts, despite the obvious fact that they too claim to be universally valid, you eventually end up with the Hobbesian war of all against all. Instead of the anarcho-primitivist utopia which you were promised at the beginning of this section, in other words, you get the horror of a violently anarchic dystopia of so many isolated maniacs battling each other ceaselessly with no hope of resolution. Rather than restore the ethical Garden of Eden, you get Apocalypse. Paragraph 380 notes that the only escape from this nightmare will lie in a new shape of consciousness altogether. Next video we will meet him in the form of the Knight of Virtue. Stay tuned.